Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Helen Raleigh. Thank you very much, especially thanks Steamboat Institute. I'm just relieved that my mother is not in the audience so she cannot criticize my hair. <laughs> it's my great honor to introduce your, uh, to you the next speaker. He's the executive director of the Enran Institute, a man with a lot of accomplishments. But most importantly, he's the most fearless and outspoken defender of capitalism. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Yaron Brooks. Stop they told me I had to walk up and shake people's hands on the way, and I said, I'm not a politician. Um, so, Helen and I have something important in common. Uh, we are both immigrants to this country. We both chose to come to America. Uh, I was born and raised in Israel uh, at a time when Israel was quite socialist, nowhere near as bad as China, not even close. But I made a decision at some point in my life, soon after finishing Atlas Shrugged, that I was going to make the most of my life that I was going to choose to go live in the place that allowed me the most freedom and the most opportunities. And I chose, therefore, from the age of 16 on, you know, strove to achieve this choice to move to the United States. And I came here in 1987 uh, with my wife and um, became a citizen in 2003. And I came here because in 1987 I still believed that America was it, that it was the freest country in the world. It was the country with the most opportunities. It was the country when an immigrant could still come and make something of himself. It was still the land of opportunity that we were told about in stories. And the sad thing is that I've been disappointed. America is drifting away from that vision, from that promise, for what it used to be. And I know that right now it's easy. It's easy to blame Obama for everything. It's Obama this and Obama that and Obama so on. And you should because Obama's terrible. Anything you can do to get rid of him is a good thing. <laughs> but let's be honest. This didn't start with Obama. It's not going to end with Obama. This has been a trend, a trend, for at least 100 years. You know, 2013 is an important year because it's 100 years from the first massive status laws passed by the United States. Maybe the worst president in American history, Woodrow Wilson. 1913 saw the introduction of the income tax. 1913 saw the establishment of the Federal Reserve. We're paying dearly for both of those today. For 100 years, we have drifted from the vision of the Founding Fathers. For 100 years, we have moved away from capitalism, from limited government, from the idea, the vision of individual rights. We are so removed from the idea of individual rights that I would bet you that 9 out of 10 Americans don't even know what the term means. Yet, it is the foundational term for this country. It is the principle on which this country was founded. There is no America if not for the concept of individual rights. In spite of what the congressman said, this country is not about its people. This country is not about its government. What makes this country unique is the ideas of the founding fathers. This is the first country in human history founded on a moral principle. 
the first country in human history founded on ideas. And what is this idea? What is the idea that, America, that Americans fought a revolution over? Was it tea taxes? Was it a stamp tax? They just got pissed off by a, by a, a king? No, there was an ideological revolution that happened in this country. A once in human history revolution. Before America, who did your life belong to? Before America, who did your life belong to? A king, King George, queens, tribes, ethnic groups, races. Your life belonged to some collective, some leader, some government, somebody else. The American Revolution is about a rejection of that idea. The American founders said, no, my life does not belong to anybody. My life does not belong to the political party. It doesn't belong to the group. It doesn't belong to the tribe. It doesn't belong to a king. It belongs to me. My life is mine. They called that the Declaration of Independence. Now, you could view that Declaration of Independence as a Declaration of Independence from England. But there's another way to view that Declaration of Independence. It's a declaration of each American's independence to stand as a free man and woman, owning their own life, committed to their own life. The Declaration of Independence articulates the idea for the first time in human history. And this is what makes America great. This is why it's been successful. That each one of us, each one of us has an inalienable right. An inalienable right. What does inalienable mean? Inalienable. What does it mean? Nobody can take it away. What about 99% of the vote? 99%? No. Inalienable needs nobody. Nobody can take these rights away. And what do you have an inalienable right to? To, to? to be your brother's keeper? To maximize social utility? To help your fellow man? To be a good Samaritan? What do you have an inalienable right to be? You have an inalienable right to your life. And what does a right mean? What does it mean to say somebody has a right to? What does it mean? It means you have freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom's a nice word we throw up. Everybody cheers. We say, we're for freedom. But what does it mean? Free from? Coercion. Free from force. So what does it mean to have a right to life? An inalienable right to life that nobody can take it away from you. It means you have a freedom to live your life as you see fit. You have a right to make decisions to pursue values that you believe are good for you, and nobody can interfere with that. Not even a majority. They can't vote your values away. They don't have a right to take your stuff away. They can't have a right to change your path. That's what the right to life means. That's what the founders meant. They meant a life free of coercion. They meant a life free, and who are the biggest courses in human history, by the way? Government. Read Madison. Government is the biggest courser there is. So it's free of government coercion. The founding fathers were radicals. The founding fathers were radicals. They were way out there. Nobody ever had articulated these kind of ideas in a political setting. I mean, they were... They were inherited a long tradition from Locke and Montesquieu and the, the Scottish and French Enlightenment. But they were the first politi politicians, if you will, political leaders to ever articulate this and put it into practice. The idea that every individual is an end to himself, that every individual has a right, inalienable right, to pursue their own values, to pursue their own life, to pursue the values that they believe are necessary for their own life. That's what made America great. That's why this country has been successful. And that is what we have lost. We don't have rights anymore. You have a right to property? Anybody have a right to property? 
well, 50%. The other 50% is taken away from you by vote. You have a right to your home? Well, not if your neighbors decide it would be better as a tennis court. We call that eminent domain. Just look up at the Kilo decision. You don't have a right to your property. You don't have a right to make decisions for yourself. You don't have the right to start whatever business you want. In California, you need government approval to shampoo hair. It's called a license by the state. Individual rights are what we've lost. If we want a political agenda, if we want to reverse the current trends, tinkering around the edges is not going to work. I don't care if the, ball if the budget is balanced. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I don't care if the budget is balanced. Because government spends so much money, they're violating my rights so much, who cares how much they bring in and spend out? What I care is how big they are, how intrusive they are, how in my face they are, how they're involved in every aspect of my life. That's what I care about. I want government to shrink. You know how you balance the budget? I mean, everybody's for a balanced budget. Democrats want a balanced budget. They just raise taxes. A lot. And we can get a balanced budget. Right? Now, it would be nice if politicians didn't spend money they didn't have. Right? So, yeah. Deficit spending is bad, but that's not the evil. The evil is what government does today. The founding fathers created a government that protects individual rights. That's it. That's all it's supposed to do. It's not supposed to get involved in regulating business. It's not supposed to get involved in what our kids study in school. It's not supposed to get involved in the health care choices we make. It's not supposed to get involved in redistributing our wealth. It's supposed to protect us from bad guys. We can't even do that. You just saw a panel here, and I know your frustration because not one of them gave you a solution. Not one of them told you how the government is going to help you because our government can't anymore. We're so pathetic, right? People live in caves, and we can't beat them. So ask me in the Q&A. I will give you the answer. <laughs> you might not like it, but I'll give you the answer. That's all government should do is protect us from crazy people who want to kill us. All government should do is catch Bernie Madoff. They can't do that because they're so busy looking at my filings and your filings, right? How many of you invest, right? Can't invest more than 5% without letting the government know. God forbid you should own more than 5% of a company. You might be a bad guy. I mean, what's their bu why is it their business? When did they become government's business? How much money I invest in a business? Oh, if you get... 10%, now you have to find a 13D and announce to the world your intentions. Why? These are the kind of, and, and, you know, there are a million of these regulations, so we won't even get. So the SEC is so busy reading my 13Ds, they don't have time to catch Bernie Madoff. The things that they're supposed to do, they can't do because they're so busy listening to what we're doing right now, right? <laughs> you know, I'm all for the NSA listening to the bad guys. Have a listening post outside every mosque in America, fine. Right? But they're listening to all of us. And they tell us they'll never use it. Well, they'll never use it. Right? Obama said that. And within two days, it turned out that there'd been thousands of abuses. And of course, this is all in the context of the IRS, right? Where they are using information against us. So don't tell me they're not going to use it. Of course they're going to use it. Right? You listening? We're on to you. What we need is a new vision for America. An old vision for America. What we need is to return to the foundation, to the founding vision of America. But to do that, we need to understand it. Again, the founding vision of America is individual rights. The founding vision of America is freedom. Freedom of the individual from being coerced by government and by his neighbors and by terrorists. It means that as long as my neighbor doesn't have his hand in my pocket, as Jefferson said, it's none of my business what he does. It means true commitment to individual liberty. It means shrinking government down. 
to wit, only protects individual rights. You know the problem with the sequester? $80 billion sequester? Is it lacked to zero? $800 billion, now you're starting to talk. $80 billion is not shrinking government. $80 billion is a, is a, is a rounding error in what our government spends. And it's time we held the party that I think most of you belong to or most of you, uh, uh, you know, vote for. It's time we held them accountable. The Republican Party is who, I'm going to say something controversial, the Republican Party is the enemy in this sense. The Democrats are leftists. They're socialists. We know that. We know how to deal with that. They're bad guys. Well, we won't touch them. The Republican Party is supposed to be the party of the founding fathers, of a principled defense of capitalism. It's supposed to be the party of freedom, of free markets, of individual rights. But they're not. They're much closer to the Democrats, much closer to the Democrats than they are to the founders. And we let them get away with it because we don't hold them accountable. We don't hold them accountable. We're afraid of losing. We lose anyway. We lose anyway. Because even when these guys get elected, even when Republicans get elected, what do they do? They violate our rights. They increase government spending. They don't solve problems that government should be solving. Take eight years of George Bush. Government grew three times over. Everything Obama has done. Since, the, since he got elected, was just continued the policies of Bush. Bailouts, auto bailout was December 2008, Bush. Top stimulus, every Republicans went freaky because Obama suggested the stimulus package. They voted for it in 2008, but it was a smaller one. It's only 300 billion, Obama did 900 billion. But it's not the size, it's the principle. If a 300 billion stimulus is gonna work, why not a 900 billion stimulus? Stimulus has never worked. They've never worked in history. They never will work. We keep trying, right? Einstein had a name for that. You know what, he, what the name was? Yeah, you do the same thing over and over again and you expect different results? Insanity. We're insane. This country's insane. So is the rest of the world. The Republican Party is far more to the left than this group is. The Republican Party has no, nothing, to defend capitalism and free market. And I'll give you a, a fantastic example that, that they've just provided me on a silver platter. The Farm Bill. Anybody familiar with the Farm Bill? Yes. So Republicans thought they were very brave because what they did is they took the Farm Bill and they split it into two and they said, we're not gonna vote on food stamps because we think food stamps are terrible and we're not gonna vote on that. We're just gonna vote on this part, right? And we're gonna approve this part. And, and uh, this part has to do with price controls, subsidies, regulations and control over farming in America, right? Socialist fascist policies for farming. And it was voted for by every Republican in the House of Representatives. The Democrats voted against it because it didn't include food stamps. Every Republican in the, every Republican in the House of Representatives, including Tea Party Republicans, voted for a farm bill. This is socialism as applied to farming. It's cronyism as applied to farming. This is the exact opposite of free markets. The exact opposite of free markets. So how can Republicans stand up and say we're for free markets when they vote for a bill like that? They lose all credibility. They lose all moral authority. And when, you, when the party that claims to be pro-capitalist, pro-individual rights, pro-founding fathers loses their moral authority, nobody's going to believe them. Nobody's going to trust them. And they can never fight for those real values. I'll give you another example from Obamacare. Obamacare is great, right? Defeat it. We should fight to defeat it. We should do everything we can. It is a monster. It is awful. It is a huge step towards single-payer, universal health care, socialized medicine. But you will never defeat socialized medicine unless you're willing to propose an alternative. Today's health care system is broken. It's broken. Health care costs are rising. A lot of people don't have insurance. It's not a healthy system. So we have to fix it. Obama's proposed an alternative, 
An alternative, by the way, should come as no surprise. This has been the left's agenda for the last 50 years. Socialized medicine, they've told us, they've told us it's coming, they've been advocating for it, it's right there in front of us. Where's the free market alternative? Where's the plan to liberate healthcare from government involvement? Where's the individual rights-based alternative to Obamacare? Where is it? They're cowards. They're afraid to propose it. I've been told that they're afraid to propose it because the American people might not like it. But if you don't present a vision, if you don't present an alternative, if you don't present what life can and should be like, then you will lose. You might not lose right now, but you will lose ultimately. When the, when the, when the uh, Democrats first proposed socialized medicine 50, 60 years ago, they were going to lose. But they presented a vision, and then every year they walked towards that vision, slowly, systematically, digitally. You remember they tried Hillary K, and they failed, but that's okay. They stepped back, they regrouped, and they tried again. If Republicans presented an image of what a free market healthcare system would look like, where, where you had real choice between doctors, where you had private insurance that you owned, so when you lost your job, you wouldn't lose your health care. How did we combine jobs with health care? I have no idea. Price and wage control during World War II. I know exactly where, but, right? <laughs> Phase of speech. <laughs> An image of innovation and competition that is possible in the health care space. A vision of what true private health care would look like. And we could say, look, we're not going to get there anytime soon. It's going to take maybe 50 years to get there. But let's start moving in that direction. Let's start innovating towards that. Let's make compromises with Democrats in that direction rather than the opposite. But you have to have a vision. And by the way, that vision has to include, has to include, if you're going to be uncomfortable, doing away with Medicare and Medicaid. Because you're a hypocrite if you say socialized medicine is okay if you're over 65, but not okay if you're under. And they get you on this. I remember an op-ed by Michael Steele. Remember Michael Steele? He was the chairman of the Republican Party during the Obamacare debate. And he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, look, we're against Obamacare because we hate socialized medicine. We, we think socialized medicine is awful. And we will fight to the death against socialized medicine. By the way, we will protect Medicare better than anybody else. And the next morning, he was on NPR. I listen to NPR every morning because I want to know what the enemy's thinking. So <laughs> it's important. The next morning on NPR, he's asked, well, if you're so opposed to socialized medicine, how come you're for Medicare? And he couldn't answer. He couldn't answer. Medicare is socialized medicine. And with all due respect to all of you, some of you I know are receiving Medicare, you're receiving it on the backs of your children and grandchildren. You're going to bankrupt this country. Medicare will bankrupt this country. It's much worse than Social Security, any other system out there. It is the one single most expensive program we have. We don't have it funded. We cannot fund it. Your children and grandchildren will have to pay four times more taxes than you ever did to fund your health care. That has to be one of the most immoral things in human history. It's wrong. It's immoral, it's unjust, it's unfair. Let's throw all these moral terms back at Obama. But we have to have a vision. How do we wind down Medicare? You can't just do away with it tomorrow, right? You have to wind down it. Let's have a plan. Paul Ryan's plan was a first step. We make it a voucher system. That's a first step. But even Paul Ryan doesn't have the guts to say it's a first step towards. Right? <laughs> Paul Ryan's budget is a good illustration of Republicans, right? I mean, I love Paul Ryan. I think he's great. But he proposed a budget that was considered radical. You remember, he was throwing grandmothers off the cliff. And it was going to shrink government. You know how much it shrunk government by? How much did it shrink government by? Because it didn't. Nobody can come up with a number because it didn't shrink government at all. <laughs> Paul Ryan's budget involves increasing government spending by 3.5% every year for the next 10 years. The reason they said it was cutting is because Obama's budget would increase it by 5.5% every year. Now, if you did that kind of accounting in your business, you would go to jail for fraud. Right? Oh, 
I, 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 I cut spending, right? Because I didn't spend as much as my wife would have spent. <laughs> I try that sometime. <laughs> That's Republicans. Why don't Republicans say, look, we, nobody cuts spending in Washington. We're shrinking the growth rate. Be honest at least with the American people. Say it like it is. And do we call them on it? We don't call them on it. It's our fault. Look, I, I, we can rile on politicians all we want, all day long, all night long. And the fact is it's our fault because we elect them. We re-elect them. We re-elect them again, right? Everybody hates Congress except for their congressmen. All the polls show this. The, the approval rating of Congress is on like 12%, but everybody loves their own congressmen. But our own congressman is just as bad as the rest of them, believe me. I shouldn't say that because at 4.30, I'm being interviewed by Congressman Campbell. Uh, for his, he's on the radio today, and, he, and, he, and he's having me on, so I should be nice. Um, it's hard for me, though. He'll, he, he knows. He'll get it from me. Um, we need a political party. We need a political party that stands for principles, for reality for individualism, for individual rights, for capitalism and free markets. We need a political party that says to farmers, we are not going to subsidize you. We're not going to put price controls on you. We're not going to tell you what to grow and what not to grow. We're not going to tell you to keep your farmland, you know, vacant. We're going to let the free, we believe in free markets, so we're going to let the free market dictate farm prices. That's the kind of, of congressman we need. That's the kind of political party we need. That says the financial crisis wasn't caused by free markets, because let me tell you a secret. In 2007, there were no free markets in the US. I know that comes as a shock. But banks who failed were the most regulated industry in America. What free market? Every bank in the United States is regulated by at least five different agencies. The Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the OCC, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. It's an office that was invented during the Civil War, and they keep reinventing its function because they don't want to go away, right? <laughs> Typical bureaucracy, right? State bank regulators and the SEC. Five. So it couldn't have been free markets that failed in 2008. So how about a Republican platform or a political party platform that says we're going to deregulate? And we heard the congressman say, uh, we're going to evaluate regulations based on whether they're good. They're all bad. <laughs> what do you mean based on what they were good? How about repealing Dodd-Frank, repealing Sarbanes-Oxley, and repealing every regulatory bill of the last 50 years? <laughs> what good regulations? What good regulations? What businessman here, you know, in his industry, are the regulations helping? They're hurting you as a businessman. They're hurting consumers. They're hurting the American people. They're hurting all of us. Look what they're doing to Apple right now and what they're doing to, uh, you know, what they did to Microsoft and what they're doing to uh, US Air and American Airlines, of all people. They're going after them now, right? We live in this massive state, regulatory state, entitlement state. We need a political party that would question both of those, challenge both of those. We need to stop redistributing, and we need to stop the cronyism of regulation and the cronyism of subsidies. We need free markets. We need to be America. We need a return to being America, protecting individuals from crooks. That's what the government's there for. Leave us alone. Get your hands out of our pockets. And I have to tell you, if the Republican Party is not going to up, step up to do that, to stand for that, then we need a new political party. We need a third party. Now, if you guys believe you can reform the Republican Party, all the power to you. It's cheaper and easier. I don't see any evidence that that's true. I just don't see it. We need a party, a pro-capitalist party, a pro-free market party, a pro-individual rights party. We need to resurrect the spirit of the founders. And not the spirit of the founders superficially, but the spirit of the founders ideologically. We need to be radicals. Radicals with a capital R. Don't be afraid of the word. It means nonconformist, not part of the mainstream. We're not part of the mainstream, I hope. I'm not. 
I hope you guys are not. We're for something. We're for this great country. What we need in this country today is a movement, a movement based on the principle of individual rights, on the principle of inalienable rights. We're not a democracy party. This country's not a democracy. I hate to tell you this because I know it creates cognitive dissonance. This is a constitutional republic. You cannot vote me into silence. That's what the Bill of Rights means. I have free speech, no matter how many people vote. We don't quite have it anymore, but that's the intention of the fathers, the founding fathers. Right? So we need to resurrect the spirit of inalienable rights, the right to life, the right to pursue the values that make your life possible, free of coercion from all sources, Islamist and Washingtonian. And I put those together on purpose. <laughs> you have a right, an inalienable right, to pursue your liberty, which means to think the thoughts that you want to think and act on those thoughts. And it's nobody's business to tell you what to think. There should be a separation of government from ideas. The government has, should have no ideas. They shouldn't be telling us what to think. And that, as a first you know, action of that, they shouldn't be educating our kids because they are telling our kids what to think. We need to fight for the right to liberty. And I think the most important of all our rights in the Declaration because I think it captures what it is to be an American. And it captures what America means. I came here not in pursuit of wealth. I came here not in pursuit of anything specific. I came here to pursue happiness. This country is the country of the pursuit of happiness. Each one of us is born with an inalienable right to pursue their own happiness. We need a political system. We need a government that leaves us alone and protects us so we can pursue our happiness. That is a rallying call. That is what we need to fight for. And I mean fight. I'll end with this. The founding fathers, when they wrote the Declaration, faced the mightiest military force known to man at that point. They faced the British Empire. And they committed their lives, their, uh, their, their property, and their sacred honor to fight for all of our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can we afford to do anything less than that? Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for some questions. Dr. Brook, um, it's connected only to the last panel. Could you give us your uh, impression of American foreign policy in the Middle East, what it is and what it should be? Well, first let me say that I don't believe America has a foreign policy. I don't think we, don't, I don't think we know what we're doing. I think we're clueless. I don't think America has had a foreign policy probably since World War II. This is not new. Our blindness in the Middle East is not new. Uh, this has been going on for a long time. Um, and I think, I think George Bush is as culpable here as is Obama. Um, but let me go back to, uh, to a hero of yours, Ronald Reagan. Because I think, to a large extent, well, it really starts with Jimmy Carter, right? The beginning of the modern problem in the Middle East starts in November 4th, 1979. I remember that date well. Because two things happened on that date completely unrelated. One, I was enlisted in the Israeli army which is why I remember it, right? <laughs> Second, the US Embassy was invaded in Tehran, and Americans were taken hostage for 444 days. And what did the US government do in response to that? Nothing. Zero, zilch, nada, nothing. One attempt at a rescue, which was pretty pathetic. What signal did we send the Islamists, that we, we, we heard very eloquently the threat that we face. What signal did we send? Weakness. We will not pursue the enemy. 
We will not defend our own citizens. You're, you're worried about Benghazi? These people in Tehran were there for 444 days under horrific conditions. Where was the president of the United States? Jimmy Carter, right? Um, in 1983, 244 Marines were killed in their barracks in Beirut by the Iranians and Hezbollah, the very beginnings of Hezbollah. Ronald Reagan went on television and said in front of the whole world, we will hunt them down, we will destroy them, we will kill them, nobody kills Americans, da da da, all the usual rhetoric. And what did he do? He got the Marines out of there, they took their ships and sailed home. We did nothing, nada. What message did we send the Islamists? Weakness, 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 weakness. Throughout the 1980s, Americans were kidnapped in, in Lebanon and killed. What did we do about it? Nothing. In 1990, the Cobra Towers in Saudi Arabia were bombed. I can't remember the number of, of American soldiers who were killed. What did we do about it? Nothing. I mean, you worry, again, Benghazi, four? This has been going on for decades. And we do nothing, and we American people don't stand up and demand action. We don't, you know, uh, when you join the army, you don't lose your rights. It's a job of the American government to defend the lives of their soldiers. Okay, so we get 9-11, right, which is a culmination of all these terrorist attacks of which we've done nothing. And George Bush stands up and says, okay, I'm going to do something, right? We've got to warn terrorism. You know, that's like FDR after Pearl Harbor declaring war on kamikaze pilots. <laughs> the enemy is political Islam. The enemy is Islamic totalitarianism, fascism, however you want to call it. The enemy is not terrorism. The enemy is not in Baghdad. The enemy is not even in Kabul. The enemy is in Tehran and Riyadh. The enemy is Iran and Saudi Arabia. You heard where all the funding comes from? But a month after 9-11, George Bush was hugging the prince of Saudi Arabia. They were our best friends. We love those guys. And as long as we love Saudi Arabia, this will continue. You want to know how to deal with this? Those are the two regimes that have to go. Go. You want to deal with this? We have to stand up for what it means to be America. You remember the forward strategy for freedom, 2005? This was Bush's foreign policy. Bringing democracy to the Middle East. Well, we're getting democracy in Egypt. And if you had democracy in Syria and in Jordan, they would both be Muslim Brotherhood countries. The solution is not democracy. The solution is America standing up for itself and defending itself. We are fighting people in caves. We have the mightiest military force in human history. We can defeat these guys in weeks if we're willing to fight. But we send our Marines over and we tie their hands up and we put lawyers with them so they can't shoot at anybody because, God forbid, somebody might die. Let me tell you something that General Sherman said, one of my great heroes, and I've said this in Atlanta. <laughs> I have. Taking my life into my own hands. <laughs> War is hell. And if you're not willing to make it hell, stay home. That's the Israeli in me talking. <laughs> so how do we win it? How do we do foreign policy? We go to where the enemy is, two countries, Iran, Saudi Arabia. We destroy one of them, and we tell the other, if you don't behave, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> but this is, you see, this is why Fox won't have me on anymore, <laughs> which is true, true story. They won't have me on anymore, except Stossel. Stossel's the only one who will have me. <laughs> Second question. Ron, you uh, talked about a new political party and uh, eloquently outlined you know, the foundation and the principles that that would stand for. Um, part of what we fight, I think, is uh, those of us that somewhere on the right spectrum here is how do we, what does that message sound like for youth today? That's great. And what brings them to the, to the party, if you will? So this is, this is a challenge we face. The average age in this room is about 65. 
And that's only because there are like three people in their 20s who drive the average down. <laughs> this, is a, this is almost dominantly old and white. And you're a minority. We're a minority. This is a message, and I believe we have the message, that we need to ignite young people with. And this is why I think we should be radical. Young people love radical. They do. They want to be excited about something. They want to be passionate about something. They want a cause. They want a vision to fight for. So what do we need to do? One, the fact is that young people don't know economics. They have no clue about it. They don't care about it. They've never got the paycheck. They've never had taxes taken out of them. That is not what they vote. They don't vote economics. And you have to acknowledge the fact that they are being brainwashed as we speak by leftist professors and high school teachers. So you can't blame them for not knowing anything about economics. But what do they care about? Because they live it. They care about social issues. Because that's the world they live in. Republicans want to make a big deal out of social issues? Fine. But you're going to lose the youth vote. You're going to lose it. You lost it this last election. You're going to lose it forever. I mean, with all due respect, why is it any of our business if two gay people want to marry? Let them live. Let them live. You might be offended because it offends your religion. Fine. Don't associate with them. But you don't. You know, don't have all these laws against it and accept the fact we're the party, supposed to be the party, right, of individual liberty. Well, individual liberty doesn't mean what you think they should do. It doesn't mean your values. It means liberty. It means whatever ideas they have, whether you think they're good or bad, whether you think they're moral or not, government is not an instrument to impose your morality on other people. That's not what government's there for. It's to protect people of different <laughs> codes. So we need to drop the social issues. I mean, I think we should take the right side of the social issues, but given that that's a reach for many people, let's just not talk about them. How about not talking about rape when you're running for Senate? <laughs> that would be a good Republican strategy, just generally, right? <laughs> so to get young people, you need, to, you need to switch sides on the social issues, on many of the social issues. Number two. You gotta project a vision. You gotta have a dream. You gotta tell them what the world will look like and why their world would be better. And you have to relate to their values, whether it's an iPhone, they understand iPhones. Well, tell them what makes this? How does this come about? Was this created by government? What would it look like if it was created by government? <laughs> they get it. They don't want it, so then ask them. Do they want their health care to be this quality? Or do they want it to be the quality of an iPhone created by government? Right? Relate to the things that they are passionate about, that they understand. Right? You got to have a vision. You also, we also got to have, we also got to portray it in terms of their happiness, right? I believe that this party, this new political party or the Republican Party or whatever, should be the party for the pursuit of happiness. That's cool. Right, for young people. What does that mean? We need to explain to them, for example, that to the extent that they get goodies from government, they will never be happy. Think about it. Where does your happiness come from? Your happiness comes from your self-esteem. You have to have self-esteem, confidence. You have, to be, you have to think of yourself as worthy if you're going to be happy. Where does our self-esteem come from? Ribbons? Self-esteem come from everybody getting a ribbon? The self-esteem come from your parents patting you on the back? Where does self-esteem come from? This is the most important question we could have. From what? From accomplishment, from achievement, from setting goals and attaining them. Where in our life do we achieve goals? Do we set goals? Do we strive towards goals? What is the activity we most engage in in which we achieve and set goals? Work. Career, being productive. Nobody who doesn't work can ever be happy. Now, I count being at home, taking care of kids, hard work. <laughs> right? But if you don't work, you will never 
be happy, ever. So when you give a welfare kid a check, you are destroying their lives. You are guaranteeing that they will never be happy. You are guaranteeing them into, in, into poverty for the rest of their life because they'll never learn the skills. We need to explain that to young people. That, that entitlement state is destroying the people it's supposedly trying to help. And I say supposedly because I don't believe they want to help anybody. Entitlement state's about power. It's not about helping. And we need to go into poor neighborhoods. And we need to tell poor kids that their lives are being destroyed. And, and something else the cognitive said flipped me out, right? Minimum wage. My favorite topic, one of my favorite topics. Who does minimum wage help? No, no, it helps some people. Who does it help? It helps the unions. Because union pay is tied to the minimum wage. The only reason they want to increase minimum wage is because union wages will go up. Who does it hurt? Employers. OK, well, they're rich. Who cares? Consumers. It hurts consumers. But who else does it hurt? Kids. It hurts poor youth. It, will, it hurts minority youth. If you're a kid and you know nothing, a lot of kids know nothing, in spite of what they think, um, and you can produce at five bucks an hour, that's what you can produce. If you set the minimum wage at 10 bucks an hour, who's going to employ you? Nobody. Nobody. Minimum wage is one of the most evil laws ever instituted. It hurts poor inner city kids. They don't get a $5 a an hour job. And if they got that job, they would learn skills that would then allow them to get $7, which they learn skills which allow them to get $15, which maybe one day they'll be making $100 or $200 $1,000 an hour. There's no limit under capitalism. But if you don't get the start, as many of you know, I'm sure many of you come from poor backgrounds and started out at the bottom, right? If you don't get that first chance, if you don't learn those basic skills of showing up to work on time and working hard and, and, and treating the customer right, and you'll never rise up. So minimum wage is a law instituted in order to keep the poor poor. Now that's a message that we need to advocate. This is, by the way, Economics 101. You will not find an economist, even Paul Krugman. Well, he's not an economist, but he's a <laughs> hack. You will not find an economist who doesn't agree with that statement. This is supply and demand. This is very simple. This is price controls. This is exactly what happens. This is not rocket science. This is economics 101. But I want to find a Republican who says, gets up on stage and says, minimum wage is destroying the youth of America. It is destroying poor kids. It is bad for the inner city kids. That's a candidate I could vote for. That's somebody to get excited about. That should be in the platform of the new New political party, getting rid. And then I think young people can get excited about it because it's kind of interesting. Ah, kids like me don't get a break. I'm denying them by being for minimum wage. They can relate to these kind of things. And you can go on and on and on. There are lots of things. So we have to emphasize happiness. We have to emphasize that the statism destroys everybody's life, that it's anti-ambition, including the ambitious poor, that it's destroying life. And of course, the other thing, and this will be my last point about young people, they don't, they're not going to have a future. They just don't have one. Right? They're going to have to pay for your health care. They're going to have to pay for your Social Security. They have to pay for all the other government services that are involved. Their tax rates are going to be through the roof to get a balanced budget. Right? They're going to have a, a federal $17 trillion of debt. That's just now. It's going to be $20, $30, $40, $50 $50 trillion of debt. They're going to have to pay for it. It means higher interest rates. It means... All kinds of bad stuff. Their future is being mortgaged by us. That's a message to tell them. It's time for them to reverse that. It's time for them to stand up for their own rights, for their own life, for their own happiness. Next question. Do you want me to do a quick wrap up? <laughs> I don't know what quick means. Look, I don't know if what we need is a third party or if the Republican Party could be saved. But I do know that we need a new story. We need a new vision for America. We need politicians who are willing to say, 
I'm for private health care 100%, including no Medicare and Medicaid, and I'm moving towards that. I'm for doing away with the minimum wage. I'm for defending America and standing up to the, to the evil in the world. I am for the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are the kind of politicians we need to start electing. Those are the kind of ideas we need to start demanding our politicians live up to. And if they don't, we need to kick them out. Even if it means the Democrats win for a while. If we move the political party in the right direction, it's okay to lose for a while. Because at least there's hope. Right now there's no hope. Because there's nobody even talking our language. There's nobody on the political frame who's even close to what we stand for. Can, can you arrange for a birth certificate uh, from Hawaii? <laughs> I, am, I am much more valuable to you, much more valuable to you, going out there on college campuses and among young people and talking and lecturing and speaking. Every time I go to Washington, I feel like I have to clean myself thoroughly afterwards. <laughs> it is a disgusting place. Everybody there either has their hand in my pocket or is paying somebody to stick their hand in my pocket. I don't want to have anything to do with that place. But, but yes, we need good people to run. And we need, but more important than the end, and the, you know, I'll end with this, right? What can one do, right? Because it's so depressing. What you have to do is speak up. And you have to be radical when you speak up. Don't be embarrassed. You are right. They are wrong. Don't be embarrassed by that. So you're the minority. The founders were in a smaller minority. Again, they put their lives at stake. What are you going to do? Somebody will say you're wrong? Somebody would be pissed off at you around the dinner, dinner table? What's at stake here? Speak up. Write. Demand. 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 Do not. Do not compromise. Never compromise. Let the politicians do that. We do not compromise. Thank you. Until we